It's, it's the first time we've had a chance here to catch up since you reported results on March 14th. Better than expected, Mark, on the top and the bottom. I do want to drill down into this guidance, though, Mark. So Q4 sales, uh, you expect that to be flat to down 2%. I think a lot of investors uh, listening, Mark, just want to know, how do you expect to get this company's uh, overall growth rate back to the mid to high single digits from here? And, and why are you confident you can make that happen? Well, first, that's a USD number as opposed to a CD number. So USD, of course, being in dollars, and uh, we have currency that goes against us. So we'll have um, uh, more positive uh, revenue growth than you described in, in local currency. Uh, as I said on the call, FY19 overall growth will be uh, positive. Uh, that will be higher than FY18 growth, and FY20 growth will be higher than FY19 growth. And uh, it's all due to the fact of our bookings, you know, just frankly, the fact that our, gro our, our growth businesses um, are growing and becoming bigger as a part of the total company. And the businesses we've been exiting are becoming smaller as a part of the total company. So our applications business, our, our, our new set of apps is growing 35 percent. Our Fusion ERP is growing 47 percent. Our NetSuite business in the quarter grew 28 percent. Uh, and I could go on and on with these with these sort of growth rates, and those just become bigger and bigger parts of the company, and overall they then tend to to drive the overall growth rate higher. And I want to uh, drill down, Mark, into your database business, uh, the bread and butter, because we did have MongoDB's uh, CEO on CNBC recently, and he suggested Oracle's technology there was simply outdated. He told us that the world has moved on to a more modern data platform uh, like his. What's your response to that, Mark? I, I, I just think look at the numbers, right? I mean, look at our growth relative to the market growth. You know, we have uh, roughly 50% of the market. Every other database dollar is is uh, is spent with us. And if you look at, don't even take one quarter, take 12 quarters. We're growing faster than the overall market, which is a $40 billion market. And so we've roughly gained a bit of share. And we've just introducing the most exciting database release that we've had in our history, which is autonomous database, which is now going to bring a whole set of capabilities from artificial intelligence actually being integrated to the database. So from a feature set perspective, whatever this guy is you're talking about was saying, um, this is, um, you know, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years ahead of sort of that, that technology. So, um, you know, again, I just think the best thing you can do when you get comments like that is just look at the numbers and look at the facts and see what they're telling you. And they tell you we're growing faster than the market and gaining share. And I predict, you, uh, I predict no. for you, Josh, by the way, it's going to accelerate with, with autonomous TV. And, Mark, uh, Warren Buffett recently on CNBC, and I want to bring you those comments, too, because he said he quickly sold Berkshire's stake in Oracle. And the reason he said that, Mark, is he said, listen, I simply uh, don't understand Oracle's business. My question is whether you think um, or whether you're concerned that other investors might, might feel the same way. Because when I talk to financial analysts who cover the company, they say, listen, at least right now, we're just not getting enough metrics to really have a clear line of insight into how Oracle's cloud business is really performing. How do you think about that? Well, I think, again, we're trying to give metrics that align to our strategy. So as a result, when you look at, at how we report, for example, you know, our, li our license business, which is now a license you can bring to the cloud or uh, to work in your data center, traditional, if you will, on-premise, um, we now report that as a, as a separate line, and we did that because um, much of our currencies that when you buy a license, you can use that in the cloud or any way you'd like. And so we're trying to report in a consistent way that we think gives investors transparency to what we're really working on. So reporting, my view has always been reporting numbers that aren't exactly what we're driving uh, internally is not a good thing. It's not really helping with trans more metrics isn't always good if they're not giving you a true indication of where the company's headed. So we report in the context that we do trying to give just as much clarity and alignment to our strategy. So it isn't really, Josh, about reporting for us. It's about the alignment of the reporting to our strategy uh, overall. And we think that's what we've done with our reporting over the last year. I want to switch gears a bit here, Mark, because you're also focused on capital return, right? You bought back another $10 billion in the quarter. Um, it is uh, occurring, though, against this backdrop where we know there's this arms race in tech. You have companies out there, rivals out there. They're going out. They're making meaningful acquisitions. So why not spend more money on M&A, Mark? Go out there, roll up some real companies. Is, is there a reason you're not more active in M&A? 
Well, I think overall we're not capital constrained. Let me start with that. So it isn't a choice where you're saying, hey, do this versus that. Um, we could, uh, you know, do more of each. Uh, we're certainly investing. We're in the process of rolling out uh, more data centers uh, than we've ever rolled out in our history as we speak. Now, the ability for us, we've actually reduced the cost of rolling out those data centers, so it doesn't really affect our, our, our CapEx, meaning there really is no CapEx uh, increase. Our stock, uh, on the other hand, is a very uh, attractive buy at this price. Um, and so we continue to be clear that we're going to invest as we think appropriate um, at certain prices, and, and you know, this is, is sort of one of them. You saw us simultaneously increase the dividend. Um, and we did that simultaneously with, 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 with the buyback. If we saw an M&A target, and Josh, it's always a lot easier to talk about M&A in the generic sense of would you go buy somebody, but in the end you have to find a specific target that makes sense strategically to go buy. And so I would not rule out that we would, we would buy somebody, but it has to be somebody that fits in the context of what we're doing. We spent multiple years here, and we're just about to flip the switch to now driving to, to increased organic growth based on the changes we've made in, in evolving our portfolio. So for us to buy somebody that doesn't fit uh, into that strategy, probably not a great idea for us, but don't get me wrong, we continue to look, we continue to evaluate. If you ask me if you thought about this or thought about that, the answer is probably sure. Yeah, we've thought about a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily mean we'll execute upon them. But, but, but then again, it, 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 the, the answer would be it depends. Final question here, more, more broadly, listen, investors have a range of potential concerns here. Uh, Brexit, China, trade tensions, you run a big international company, customers all around the world. I, I'm just interested to get your, your general sense here of the broad macro environment, Mark. You know, I think the U.S. is good. I think when you're inside the U.S., um, uh, if you look at just a one surrogate for, for, for your question, uh, our NetSuite business, which sells to... Uh, medium and small businesses uh, and has a very big U.S. business, our growth rate, Josh, has literally doubled over the last year. We've doubled the growth rate, um, and that's on the heels of bookings that are even higher than that growth rate. And, and so the net suite uh, performance is a very good indicator of what small and medium business, I think, in the United States is thinking. When you go around the world, it's a little bit of a different story. And the implication really on technology, uh, as you get to some of these uh, concerns really gets down to one of the reasons we're doing as many data centers as we are. Uh, some of this translates into data privacy, um, you know, the ability to keep information, you know, in the country. Um, and so, you know, this causes us to have a bit different investment profile than we might have had three or four years ago. Um, and, yeah, but I'd say, you know, Western Europe is what it's been. Uh, a few challenges uh, there. Uh, you know the story in, in China. Uh, we've had tremendous performance in, in Latin America, in some Latin America markets. So I still think when you knit it all together, it's been roughly the same with a little bit of, of, of encouragement, I'd say, in the United States. I got to squeeze one very quick last one here, Mark, quickly. I got to ask about Jedi, that massive $10 billion cloud computing contract with the Pentagon. You're battling Amazon. It's gotten heated. Are you confident you're going to ultimately prevail there, Mark, and win a piece of that contract? I'm not going to bite on that, Josh. I think we'll just let it play out. I mean, the um, uh, DOD is a huge Oracle uh, customer. Uh, we'll continue to support DOD uh, every way we possibly can um, and uh, do the best we can for, for them, and we're committed to that. Um, and I, I think I'll let uh, uh, the Jedi question, the specific Jedi question, I think I'll leave that alone.